So I want to talk about uh, 203. So that's here, Linux buffer overflow with a listening shell. So um, we have to disable address-based layout randomization and download and run the vulnerable program. So it's ED3A. So let's take a look at ED3A. Um, if I can do a cat, let's do an LS and see what we have. Okay, ED3A is here. So if I do the source code, all right. So this is um, got some libraries, then it defines a copier function that takes a pointer to a string. And now, um, oh, that's, oh, shoot, int that just finds the copier function. Here's the copier function. Okay, here's main. Main is going to take a command line argument with a string. Then it's going to copy that. It's going to print out um, the address of copier here. And then it's going to print done. Uh, so there's copier down here, and I am... Ah, okay, here we are. It's going to run the copier program here on the string that came from the user. So here it takes the string from the user, it goes down here, and here it um, does a copy of the string into a buffer that has a thousand characters, and then returns. And it returns this I, and the I, this actually is an assembly language command inside C. The point of this is going to remember what ESP is. I just wanted to have a clue where it was stored. So for convenience, I wanted to store the stack pointer in this routine, near it is. So this is going to be near an address on the stack in the copier subroutine. And in the copier subroutine, there is a buffer overflow that I copy into a buffer that only has room for a thousand characters. So putting in more than a thousand will cause an overflow. And then it prints that up here. That's what it does. So if I run that, ed3a, if I don't put in a string, it tells me you have to put in a string. If I put in aaaa, then it runs, and it tells me where that, uh, where that string was stored, where the stack ends in 240. Now, if I run it again, it's always 240, so I've already turned off address space without randomization on this machine. If this number is changing on you, then you have to execute these three commands to turn off address space layout randomization, which we don't want because it makes this attack more difficult than it needs to be. So that's what's going on here. Now we're going to make a fuzzer. And I've already got that, so if I cat my fuzzer, tab, there we are. All right, so here's my fuzzer. Um, Python 3, all I do is read the length from the command line argument when this program is run, and then I print that many A's. So it's dot slash fuzzer. I put in one, I get one A. I put in 100, I get 100 A's. That's all it does. Okay, so now... I can fuzz the program. So it's, uh, uh, let's just do clear. All right, so I do dot slash ed3a, and then I put in the output of the fuzzer. And say, try 100. All right. And that works. And um, let's try 1,000. And that works. But if I do 1,100, then I get a segmentation fault. So you can get a clue how long it has to be here. And um, in fact, I think 1020 will make it crash. Yeah, so 1,000 is OK, but 1020 makes it crash. So the last 20 bytes there, something in there ended up in the instruction pointer. All right, now I see a question here. How do stack buffer overflows work in ARM since the return address is stored in a register rather on the stack? Um, I think it's on the stack. We will do stack buffer overflows in ARM, um, and I think they work out just the same. There are some projects, if you look down below, where you do it on ARM, and uh, I'll probably write some more as we go ahead now that I have the M1 so I can do more ARM projects. But I think it's the same, but um, I haven't done those projects in a year or so, so I might be remembering them wrong. Anyway, so, uh, all right, so now we have determined the, uh, that what 20, that 1020 is enough to make the overflow, so we can look at this in the debugger. GDB minus Q ED3A, uh, 3A reps, got to get out of here and try that again, ED3A, there. And now I can run um, dollars dot slash fuzzer 1020. 
There, that should do it. Now it crashes, and you see I have AAAA in the, um, in the instruction pointer. So that shows that some of those letters ended up right in the instruction pointer, which is what you expect. So now, to find the EIP, I make an attack called EX1. So I'll put it in this other window, and I can make it smaller and higher so it's easier to see in the room. All right, so I get EX1, prints 1,000 of these, and then B, 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 C, 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 D, 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 E, E, E. That's 20 more characters in a pattern. So that's all it does, and therefore I'll be able to see what ends up in the instruction pointer. So I run with EX1. And continue. And so it ends up with 45, 45, 45, 45. That's A, B, C, D, E. The four E's ended up in the instruction pointer. So uh, now I should be able to make one that targets the instruction pointer carefully. Oh, maybe I've done enough here. Yep, okay, E, E. So now I know how to hit it. Now we need to get shell code. To get shell code, we're going to use Metasploit, and we're not going to write our own. You can install Metasploit uh, with these commands. Just download it and run it. I've already got it installed on my machine. And then you can uh, create your attack. Now, when you're using Google Cloud Machines, which is what I wrote this project for, you have to use sudo to run MSF Venom. If you're not in the cloud, you don't need to run sudo, although it's harmless if you do. And here you see payloads for Linux that bind to TCP. And there are a few such slings. It's kind of slow. I'm not going to do it live. But it shows you those attacks. It turns out the one that's simplest and easiest to use is this one, Linux x86 shell bind TCP. That will listen for a connection on a TCP port and give you a command line. And we're using 32-bit code, so x86 is appropriate. So this is the command that will create that shell code. Well, actually, first it lists the options. You can see how it works. If you list the options, it gives you a summary of it. And it shows you there's only two options you need, local port and remote host. This one is not required, and this one has a default value of 4444, which is why I like to use this. It doesn't require any parameters. If I'm willing to use the, all, it's very easy to use. Here all I did was I set the local port to 31337 instead of 4444. That's not really necessary, but that's what I did. And then I want the code in Python, format Python. So when you execute this command, it will give you Shell code. And by the way, one thing to be aware of is it's different every time. So if I run this now in this machine here, all right, there's the MSF Venom. And it won't take very long, about 30 seconds or so to generate the code. OK. You notice I got um, 80 CD, 0 B, B, 0. Actually, looks like it is the same this time, huh? No, it isn't. See, 53 2F. Um, it's for one thing, it's 400 bytes, and this was 382 bytes, so even the size is a little different. Anyway, the point is, if, and I think if I just run it twice, I'll get different answers, because the um, encoding includes some kind of variation. Let's just run it twice and see if what I'm saying is true. Okay, if you just look up this side, and it looks like it's the same both times, B0, 69, no, looks like this time it is the same every time. That's surprising. It depends on the encoding routine you use. Um, I think since I didn't do any encoding or skip any bad characters or anything, it's the same every time. However, this one has a null byte in it. And um, mine now might have a null byte in it too, although I'm not spotting it. Since it's the same, I find it in the second row, a little more than halfway across. Yep, there it is. So it has a null byte in it. So the raw shell code created has a null byte, and that will never work. The null byte will terminate the string, and it won't all go up. So I need to make one of these without bad characters. Now, this will avoid null bytes. If you put minus b minus x0, 0. zero. Um, however, we might have other bad characters like spaces and tabs and carriage returns. And I know this attack is really small. It's only 78 bytes big. And I have 1,000 bytes to work with. So I don't really need to make it small. So I'm just going to use the um, alpha mixed. This will use just letters, uppercase, lowercase, and numbers, nothing else. So this command will give me a um, attack that uses only letters and therefore will not get destroyed when it's fed in through a string variable. So if I run that one, the previous payload was 78 bytes. 
Now it's 232 bytes, and there it is. And if I run it again, it'll be different. But you see, these are all printable characters. 50 and 60, 32 is a space. So this will be, um, this will not get destroyed. Okay, so that's the point. It's now you copy that and, and paste it into an attack file. Um, so you end up putting uh, the header up here, put the buffer lines, and then put this sled here. So let me just uh, show you that one. It's ex2. All right, if I nan uh, cat, I guess I'll nano. All right. <coughs> so this is just the shebang line to tell the uh, interpreter what language it's written in so it can execute it. Then I import the sys library. Then I put in the code that Metasploit created. Then I make a NOP sled, 500 bytes of NOP sled, since this is not even 500 bytes long. Now I have a suffix, which is going to be enough age to make the total 1,012. So you take 1,012 and subtract the length of the NOP sled and the length of the buffer and give me that many A's. So I get to total 10,012 bytes. And then I know the next four bytes are going to be the instruction pointer. I still don't know what value to put in the instruction pointer, so I'm just going to put in one, two, three, four as a placeholder, and now that's what I'm going to print. The NOP sled, then the buffer, then the suffix, and then the EIP. <coughs> so that's EX2. So I run that in the debugger, EX2, and say yeah, yes. And it crashes with one, two, three, four in the instruction pointer. Now, that's okay. I wanted to examine the stack. So if I do info registers, ESP is here at D210, and EBP has been trashed. So I've gone too far, and some things have been corrupted. So I'm going to need to add a breakpoint. Now, I can use source code debugging again. If I do list, It'll show me some of the program. I want to see more of than that. So let's try 1 to 30. All right. So here's the copier routine. There's where the buffer overflow is at this string copy. So I want to stop after that. I want to break at line 20. So now I'm going to run it again with the same input. Start from the beginning. Now it breaks. Instead of crashing, it breaks here, and now I can see what's happening. So I do info registers. Now I see ESP is E10 and EBP is D208. So this is pretty big stack because remember it's got a, a uh, array that's a thousand bytes long. That's the, so it's going to be about a thousand bytes here. So it goes from CE to D2. So D208, this is what I need to remember. D208 is the end of the stack frame. So I X, I say 440X, um, about 1,000, probably 200 would do. 200X ESP, and I'm just going to look for this address, D208, okay? D2048, here's D208. So this is the stack frame. There. The start of the stack frame to the end. Here's all the NOP sleds I put in, all these 90s. And down here is the code that came from, with Metasploit. Uh, oh, and I didn't go down to D208. And it looks like I didn't print enough to get all the way to the end. But I don't really need to get to the end. Um, I, I, I just wanted to find a spot in the NOP sled. So here's the NOP sled. Here's the Metasploit attack. And uh, down here is the A's I'm padding with, and then later down below is the EIP. But I don't really care about that. All I wanted to do is find an address in the NOP sled. And as you can see, any one of these addresses will do. Just pick one that doesn't contain a null byte like that one. So an address like this, FFFFCF10, would work. Let's see what I used in EX3. Clear, cat, EX3. And I used CF50 there, and you can see that's fine. CF50 is in the NOP sled. That's why you use an op sled. It makes your life easier. You just have to hit any address up there, and then it will execute nop, 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 and then run the egg, which is the injected code. So here is the same as before. All I did was instead of having 
a placeholder, and I'll put in the real address here, FFFFCF50. So that's um, EX3. So if I run that one, it should perform the attack. So um, I EX3, say yes. It hits the breakpoint. I'm just going to continue because I think it's working. And now it keeps running. It doesn't stop. It doesn't crash. It's running. And now if I do a clear and I do SS minus pent, I do have a process listening on 31337. So that's it. This process has now become a Metasploit listener, and I can now control it with netcat127001. 31337. Now I have a shell. I can do ID. Um, hmm, looks like it crashed on me. That's rude. Anyway, um, it stopped. Hmm. All right, so something's not perfect about this, but I think uh, I didn't carry on that far. We got it. I think you can get a flag without it actually working, although that's rude. Um, yeah, you should be able to use the listening shell. Um, I'm troubled by the fact that it stopped. I should have been able to do this with netcat and do who am I? Hmm. However, I think I saw this. My netcat commands are different. Nope. One twenty-seven zero zero one three zero three three seven. Just the same. Yeah. You know, but I think I saw. I've seen this happen before where it crashed. And that's why I didn't make this the flag. I made the flag up here, or flag um, the user's value covered by a green box in the image above. Hmm, I'm somehow not seeing that box. Um, looks like there's an image missing here. Okay, I'm gonna have to look at this. I don't see how you can get the flag here. Yeah, that image seems to be missing. Let me just try refreshing this. Maybe it just didn't load properly. Because I've been using this for a while. Nope. Huh. Oh, there it is. It is over here. Okay. So the SS minus pant, that's what I thought. This is what gives you the flag. This is intentional because I found that sometimes it crashed. And I wasn't quite sure why. Uh, let me see. Just for interest, I'd like to find out why it crashed. One thing is maybe it crashes because of the debugger. Let's try running it outside the debugger. ED3A on dollars... EX3, I think, or is it EX2? EX3, okay. That should be listening now. Uh, it didn't, looks like it stopped, probably because the port, oh, this connection was still alive. I gotta close that connection. Now I gotta do um, SS minus pant. And this is still busy. See, I'm gonna have to wait for this close wait. This is a common problem. If you don't close a connection normally, it has to time out. So I gotta wait for it to quit. I can watch. SS minus pant and pipe it to grep 31337. There. Now it'll update every few seconds. So I can wait for this to quit using that port. I'm waiting. And uh, see, there's a timer here 8 seconds, 10, 12. All right, so I'll know when it's done. And when it's done, I'll be able to run that uh, exploit again. And let's see if it's, it is more stable. This depends a bit on your. Um, your operating system and your environment and such. It worked on the Google Cloud. It doesn't seem to be working so well on this machine, but um, there are some advanced options in Metasploit to handle this kind of problem, by the way. I just mentioned this. To fix, when I hit problems like this, the cure is, that's why Metasploit has all these advanced options. Uh, constructing the exploit. Okay, here, notice when I did it, I used append exit equals true. There are a bunch of other things like that, like fork and so on, where you can control how it launches the new process, and you often have to adjust those to make it stable. So the cure will be to add a couple more of these optional routines, or maybe remove that append exit. There's a, that's why they have them. There's a bunch of advanced options in Metasploit of exactly what you do when you execute the code. Okay, it's still hogging up 31337. Uh, that's rude. So maybe I'll stop this recording because uh, what I'm probably going to do later on is I'll just play with the options until I find one that works in this environment. 
and demonstrate it next time. But anyway, that's enough to get you to the flag. Uh, one other thing to mention is uh, there are some extra credit parts to this project where you get to exploit a remote server. So once you have an exploit working locally on your own machine, then you can exploit my server that's running a version of this program. And again, you can send data to it and you, you can debug it. So, you can, so if I send a string up here, if I send like AAAA and then um, debug it, it will show it to me on the server. So here's the, um, uh, here's the stack, ESP and EBP, so HC0 to CC8. Here's the A's I put in. And the stack is big from HC0 to CC8, so it is about 1,000 bytes long again. So that's, uh, there's plenty of room for you to inject code. And uh, that seems to be all that happened here. But anyway, that's all you need. From that, you can plan your exploit, and when you run it, um, then you can open a listening shell on my server. You should choose a different port than 31337 because many students will be attacking my server and they'll probably create hung services like this, hogging up a port as they crash it with mistakes. And so ports will be unavailable. So you want to try random port numbers um, so you don't hit a port that some other student has already used. And when you get a listening shell on my server, you can execute commands there. And then I think you've got a flag or something to find up there. Uh, let me see. Um, yeah, so when you're done, then you, um, here's, you can download the binary I'm using, and here's some hints. And um, uh, find the, when you get to my server, print out this file. That file contains the flag. So you just have to, all right. So that, that would be fun, and it's for extra credit. And there are some tips down here how to do it. Uh, all right, and here's, these are very similar. There's two projects. There's a 32-bit one, and this one is a 64-bit one, I think. So, a couple of challenges for you. And let me see if this thing is timed out yet. It still hasn't. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.